Amen. Wow, what a what a powerful song. Just think, one one day that will be true. That th- those of us who've been redeemed by Christ, one day we're going to open our eyes. And we're going to look up and we're going to see our Savior. You know, if you're like me, you watch the news this week and you hear about some of the stuff that happens just in our world, but even more specifically in in our own nation. And you just, you just have to shake your head and we, we, we heard about the school shooting down in Texas. One of, one of many mass shootings over the last several weeks where innocent lives were just cut short. And some people some people wonder where is God when stuff like that happens? How could God allow things like that to happen? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is God is right where we've put him. And and for a lot of people, that's completely out of sight, out of mind. And people say, well, will God stop things like that? And the answer is absolute, 100% yes. One day God is going to bring an end to that kind of suffering. And God, God is going to put an end to the broken, sinful world that we see all around us. But until that day comes, that is why we exist as a church, is, is to, to bring people to an understanding that Jesus died for them just like we sing about so that their lives can matter for more than the sin that they do. So people hopefully don't have to get to a place in life where they think their only option is to take their own life or even worse, take the lives of others and then their own life. Jesus died so that we could have hope. Hope in the life to come, but also hope in this life. Hope that it doesn't have to be as bad as as the world's making it out to be. And my heart breaks for the families that have gone through these tragedies over the the past several weeks. And, And there are no words that we can say that would somehow make it better or anything like that. All we can do is say, God, help us to to do better, to be better. Help us to to bring more people to you so that we don't see more of that happen because people are turning to you and and not turning to evil choices. So right now, um, I'm just going to say a prayer for those families that have fallen victim to, to senseless evil over the past few weeks because our heart breaks for them. And we can't fix it. You know, we can't make that better. But what we can do is go out and make a difference in the world so that doesn't keep happening like that. We can allow Jesus to use us to bring people to Him. And that's the only thing that's going to really change things. It's not... It's not us that's going to change things. It's the Jesus that's in us. And so join me as we pray. Father, when we see the news of of senseless violence and and tragic events all over the world, and especially right here at home, 
It, it breaks our hearts. Uh, our hearts grieve for the families of 19 kids and two brave teachers. And, and all we can say, Lord, is, is please help us penetrate that darkness with your light. We, we can't make the situation better for those families. They are permanently scarred by what has been taken from them. But I pray that we can point them to you. And we can point others to you. So that we can begin to turn the tide in our own nation of just pure evil. And we see glimpses of that, Lord. We see glimpses of you moving in different ways around our country. And, and I say, God, just please allow the church to step up and, and be your instruments. Let us be the light in the dark world. Let us be the hands and feet of, of Jesus. Because Jesus is the only answer. So Lord, be with those families. Bring peace that only you can bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we, we've been in a series the last few weeks, just simply called Transformed. What happens when people have a life-transforming, life-altering encounter with Jesus? And, and we're going to see a story today in the New Testament where Jesus encountered a man who was born blind. And I want you to see what happens. Look what it says in John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. There's, there's some really interesting things happening in those few verses. But the first thing I want you to see is that in this encounter, it, it says that Jesus saw a man blind from birth. And that's so important. Because honestly, he had to see the man because the man couldn't see him. Jesus took that initiative because only he can. See, the truth is, I've said this before, none of us goes out looking for Jesus. Jesus is always seeking after us, look, looking to find us. And this blind man that Jesus saw was important to him, and Jesus was about to transform his life. But when the disciples saw this blind man, they had a question for Jesus. They said, Jesus... Why is this man blind? Did he sin? Or did his parents sin? Because in their way of thinking back then, those were the only two options that existed for this man being blind from birth. That, that was their reasoning. That the first one was this concept that they had that an unborn child could somehow sin while he was in his mother's womb and that was the cause for a child being born with some kind of disability or infirmity. That, that was their mindset. Did he sin? And that was the reason he was born blind? Or was his blindness the result of his parents' sin? And his blindness was, was somehow punishment for that. Th those were really the only two options that the society that they lived in would see for a reason that a man would be born blind. I mean, ultimately, 
we, we can say that the cause for any kind of physical, mental, any kind of infirmity is ultimately sin. It's the reason for the darkness. It's the reason for the death, birth defects, all of that, spiritually speaking, can ultimately go back to this world being a broken, fallen world. But listen, what is, what is the reason Jesus say that this man was born blind? Listen to what he says. He said it was not that this man sinned or his parents. He said, don't, don't think like that. This, he wasn't punished. He said, the works of God might be displayed in him through his blindness. See, Jesus didn't find this blind man by happenstance. God created this man born blind so that he could be encountered by Jesus for this moment, for this reason, so that Jesus could heal him and God could receive the glory for it. Here's the thing, and just as a side note, when we see a disability, God sees people that are specially made. God does not want us to see people with any kind of disability as somehow less than or, or handicapped or of less worth than someone who doesn't have that. How do I know that? Because look what it says in Psalm 139. This is what Jesus thinks of every person he created, and he created them specifically for his purposes. Look what he says. In Psalm 139, starting verse 13, he said, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as of yet there were none of them. Basically, all that says is every person who's ever lived, God created you for his purpose. And he made you exactly how he wanted you to be. And so don't, don't ever see your life as having a disability. See it for what it truly is that you were wonder, wonderfully and specially and carefully created by a God who loves you. And it's those verses that help us understand how damaging something like abortion truly is. Because God created every precious child. And when we as a society begin to, to take the lives of people and, and just disregard them. Whether they are an unborn child or an innocent elementary school child in a school building or just random people on the street, we're missing out on God's special creation. And so when God created this man born blind, he didn't do that out of a punishment. He didn't do that because he, he was somehow angry at this man or this, this family. He created that man born blind so that one day the glory of God could be revealed through his encounter with Jesus. He didn't see this man born blind as having a disability. He saw him as having a special ability that was going to make an incredible difference for this entire town as they experienced the transformation that Jesus brought to him. The truth is, as much as this man who was born blind, one of his purposes in life was to have this encounter with Jesus so his life could be an example of what Jesus could do in and through people. The truth is, every one of us who are in Christ, our lives have the same kind of purpose. It might not be through a specific disability, 
but it is in our abilities that God has created us with. You might think, I don't have any special skills. I can't sing. Guess what? I can't sing. You, you would not want me to, to try to sing up here because it ain't pretty in any way, shape, or form. I don't know why God didn't give me that ability, but he didn't because he, he gave me different abilities. And he gave you different abilities. Why? To use them for his purposes and his glory. How do I know that? Look what it says in the New Testament in Ephesians 2. It says it this way. He said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Huh? What does that mean? It means just like that man born blind, just like the, the child in that womb. Before you were even in your mother's womb, God had a special plan for your life. God knew the abilities he was going to gift you with. He knew what you were going to think of those abilities. And if you were going to somehow think of yourself as, as not having as much ability, and he created you for his purposes, for his glory. And listen to what he said. He said, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared for us before we were even before the world began. And all that to say is no matter what you think of your life, your abilities or lack of abilities or lack of resources or anything else, you were created by God for his purposes and he loves you. I mean, 100% for certain. You might say, you don't know how hard my life has been. I was born into the most jacked up family. I've been abused. I, I've just been left behind. I've been all these things. No, I don't know, but God knew. And you didn't get put there as a punishment. And so stop thinking of your life as a punishment. Your life was, was given to you so that one day God's glory could be revealed through your story. Just like this man born blind. Let, let's keep reading it in that story in John chapter 9. Look what it says. So after Jesus said, no, this, this guy is not being punished. He said, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. Now look, just to, just to give you a little insight, that's not a normal occurrence. Jesus didn't go around spitting in people's faces. I mean, they thought about as highly of that as we would. If, if somebody spit in your face, you wouldn't say thank you. And, and if somebody spit on the ground, and I'm not talking just a little, I'm talking like, you know, kind of <laughs> really really got it going and they spit on the ground and, and they mixed it all together and they said, hey, rub this on your face. You're, you're, you're not probably going to be inclined to, to, to be excited about doing that. And, and many people wonder, why would Jesus do that? Why would he, he make a big show about spitting on the ground and, and making mud and, and putting that mud on the man's eyes. Because we know that Jesus didn't need any physical substance to heal this man. Jesus could have just spoken he was healed. He could have snapped his fingers. He could have just touched him on the forehead. I mean, Jesus could have done one of a, a million different things to heal this guy. But he did that. Why would he do it? And I think there's one word that explains why he did it. And that word is obedience. Yeah. Jesus didn't rub mud in the man's face because it was the mud that had magical healing powers. See, that, that mud, that clay that he made with his saliva did not create the healing. Obedience to Jesus is what healed this man. No matter how crazy it seemed, if you really want God to do a work in your life, you're going to do what he asks you to do. 
But that's what brought sight to this blind man. The fact that he obeyed Jesus. Even when other people probably thought, this guy's crazy. Why, why would... He just, he just rubbed his spit in the man's face. And that guy just let him do it? Well, let's keep reading. Look what it says, starting in verse 8 of John chapter 9. It says, The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some says, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. See, what, what followed this whole encounter what was the, the man's neighbors, the people who recognized this man, like, wait, aren't, aren't you the guy that used to sit and beg? Because as a blind man, that was literally all he could do. People would bring him to the temple courts, and, and he would beg for scraps day after day, and that was his life. That, that was all he was good for at, until that moment. And, and people said, aren't, aren't you that guy? And other people said, no, he just, he just looks like the guy. He said, no, it, it's me. But you were blind. And now you're not? Yeah. Th this guy came, the, the one they called Jesus, put mud on the ground and, and put it on my face and told me to go wash it off. And when I did, I could see. And then there goes... We're not going to read all of this chapter. But there's some incredible stuff that happens. When this man has this encounter with Jesus. The, the first part of this man's step of faith was just being obedient to Jesus when he said, Take this that I've put on your face and go wash in the pool of Siloam. And, and that obedience gave the man his sight. He couldn't tell you what Jesus looked like because he's never seen Jesus. And he didn't, and apparently, by the time the man came back, Jesus was already gone. He, he wasn't still in the same area because he couldn't identify him. And so then all these people begin to, to question him. We're, we're going to skip ahead to verse 24. Look what it says. This is after, you know, they, they didn't know what else to do, so they brought the man before the church leaders. And they said, y'all got to deal with this, because not only did Jesus heal this man in an unusual way, he did it on the Sabbath, which to them, that was unlawful, illegal. You can't do that. And so they were trying to figure out how to blame the guy that was blind that could now see for being healed on the Sabbath. And, and they went through this whole long list of questioning. Were you really blind? And then they asked his parents, was he really blind? Did he really just get healed? And, and so that's where we pick up in verse 24. It says, for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Yeah, now, now he's just getting smart with them. Because he's kind of fed up with their foolishness. In his growing testimony... That, that, that's one of the greatest stories we have. He said, look, one thing I know is I was blind and now I can see. Jesus opened my eyes. But they kept questioning him. And then they began to insult him. And, and they just, they wouldn't stop. And then, if we were to read those verses, we would find out that after this encounter, they literally threw him out of the building and said, obviously, you're not telling the truth. Obviously, some, some sort of shenanigans is going on here, so you're done here. You're no longer allowed in here. They kicked him out but because of his story. And see, what, what this blind man, who was no longer blind, 
finds remarkable about, about this whole situation is not his belief, but their unbelief. The fact that they know he was a man who had been blind. They had seen him every single day of his life. Blind, begging. And they refused to admit that Jesus would do this. They refused to see the truth that was right in front of their eyes. Well, one of the great tragedies of this story is how quickly both the disciples and then the Pharisees, the church people, try to make a connection between something bad happening to this man and, and God being responsible for it. You know, the whole the chapter starts with, God must have been pretty upset with either you or your parents to, to make you be born blind like this. Um, and a lot of people live life by that kind of philosophy. That somehow their life is a punishment by some hardcore evil God who's out to get them. And every time they step out of line, boom, God's there to, to give them another hit. And, you know, we think that's how the universe operates. Kind of a, a quid pro quo, tit for tat kind of thing. That if I do this, God's automatically going to do that in response and, you know, God does what God wants to do. He, he's not limited by our, you know, small-minded thinking or, or by theirs. Um, yeah. And as, we, as you look at this chapter, one of the crazy things that you see is the Pharisees, the church people, do everything within their power not to connect God with healing the man. That They want to make it... Something, anything else that it could possibly be besides God healed a blind man who could now see. They, they want to do everything possible. And, that, and some people are just like that. They're a whole lot more comfortable thinking of God as somehow some kind of punisher than they are God being someone who brings good out of darkness and brings dead things to life. It's much easier for some people just to see the see God as this cosmic police person that's ready to strike everybody down when they step out of line. You know, it's, it's really interesting in this entire chapter that from verse 7, when Jesus healed the guy and explains what he was doing, and then until verse 35, Jesus is nowhere to be found in the chapter. While they are arguing and, and trying to determine what really happened, Jesus had left the building. He's being ignored. And, and there's so much truth we can take from that. So often that we, we try to put our own spin on something God is doing or God has done, and we miss God altogether. We completely remove him from the situation. And it, it never ends the way God wants it to be. Here's a, here's a little bit of, in case you didn't know, God doesn't conform to our way of doing things. Yeah, exactly. Thank goodness. It is a good thing God doesn't take my suggestions. It is good for a whole lot of people. Uh, because just I'll just leave it at that. God does what God has planned to do for his purposes, for his glory. So let, let's pick the story back up when Jesus comes back into the scene in verse 35. Look what it says. It says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, he said, do you believe that I am the son of man or do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. <clears throat> See, th this man's full conversion was now complete. He started out spiritually and physically blind. And then his eyes were opened. His literal eyes and his spiritual eyes. And now he identifies the one who saved him. 
And he believed him and he worshipped him. See, faith leads to belief. Belief leads to obedience. And obedience leads to worship. If we truly believe Jesus is who he says he is, and what he did for us, we won't be able to help worshiping him. And it all goes back to where it started. Jesus saw this man born blind. See, a lot of times we make the mistake of using terminology like, yeah, I found God. I was down this road and, and I was going down this path in life and, and I found God. No, you didn't. God found you. Amen. He always finds us. We, we don't find him because he's not lost. Amen. He doesn't need to be found. See, in this chapter, we see two kinds of blindness. There, there's the, the physical blindness of the man that was transformed by the power of Jesus. But then we also see the Pharisees. And because they're unwilling to acknowledge their spiritual blindness, they can't be healed from it. Look what it says in verse 39. And this is a, this is a, a scary, scary verse in this chapter. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near heard these things and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. See, instead of faith in Jesus, the Pharisees had faith in themselves and their own abilities to, to do what they thought was right. But those who are spiritually blind and deny Jesus will, will never be able to go beyond their own view of right and wrong. Like the Pharisees. Somebody said it like this. Jesus came to earth so that, so that those who think they have spiritual insight may be shown to be blind, and those who do not suppose they have this spiritual insight may see. His whole argument centered around a person's sense of need. If someone feels no need, they'll never see. But those who knew they were blind were the ones who could be made to see. Amen. See, when we get to a place where we realize our own sinfulness, then we can realize what Jesus did for our sins. And then we can be forgiven of our sins because we realize we can't fix ourselves. The Pharisees asked what they thought was a rhetorical question. So what, are we blind too? And, and the, the, the real answer is absolutely. Because you refuse to see what's right in front of you. They were literally talking to the Savior of the world and refused to see him as that. They thought he was their enemy. Somebody else said this a different way. They said every person who realizes his or her spiritual blindness becomes a candidate for seeing. And those who refuse to recognize their spiritual blindness place themselves beyond help. You, could, you might be able to paraphrase these final words of Jesus, these last couple of verses, this way. If you would only admit your blindness, you'd, you would not be guilty of sin because I can forgive that. But because you claim your own self-righteousness, your guilt remains. How tragic is that, that so many people sit in our churches Sunday after Sunday thinking, I'm okay. I'm not as bad as that person. I do plenty for the church. I give money, I do this, I go on mission trips. I've got a whole big long list of reasons why I have to be acceptable in the eyes of God. And some of those are going to be the very people that one day stand before God and he's going to say, I never knew you. Because you were just like these Pharisees. You refused to admit it's not about you. 
and you refuse to admit your need for a savior to make you whole. You thought you had it all together. You thought you could fix it. Well, right now we're getting ready to sing and we're going to close our time together. And this will be a time for you to respond, kind of, kind of let some of the stuff we've talked about marinate a little bit. And, and my prayer is that nobody leaves this room. Nobody steps offline that's watching online without knowing for certain where they stand with God. Not hoping, not saying, well, I think I'm okay. But saying, I come to realize how blind I really am. That the truth is, I am a sinner. And my sins separate me from a holy God. And the only solution for my sinfulness is what Jesus did on the cross. When he died on the cross and he rose again to pay a price for my sinfulness that I can't ever pay for myself. Until people's eyes are opened to that self-blindedness, until they can see themselves as they really are, not when we compare ourselves to other people, but when we hold up the mirror of God's perfection and say, I'm not worthy of this, that's when we're ready to receive God's forgiveness and we understand we're not worthy, but Jesus makes us worthy. And because of Jesus, we can be counted worthy. Not by anything we've done, but what Jesus has done on our behalf. So right now, if there's anyone in here that would be honest enough to say, hey, I, I need Jesus to do that in my life. I know that I am spiritually blind. There's never been a time in my life where I've admitted my own sinfulness before a holy God and said, God, I'm broken and I know that about myself and I need what only Jesus could do in my life. See, the Bible says, he who knew no sin, meaning Jesus, became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What Jesus did makes us right before a perfect and holy God. Where sin disconnects us, Jesus reconnects us. And only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus gives sight to the blind. Only Jesus brings dead things to life. And if you're honest enough to say, I need that right now, I'm going to ask everyone just to bow your head and close your eyes. And if you're one of those that says, yes, I need that. There's never been a time in my life where I've put my faith and my trust in Jesus. I've been relying on my own abilities all this time. Whether you've been to church, never been to church, that doesn't really matter. It's all about what you do with Jesus. And if you're here and you're watching online and you're ready to say, I'm ready to have Jesus make me whole. Then I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And this prayer is not a magic formula. This is simply us doing what the Bible teaches. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you say, hey, I need that. I need Jesus to save me. I need Jesus to make me whole. Then pray this prayer silently with me. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and you rose again. Come into my life, forgive my sin, and make me new. Thank you for saving me. Amen.